And uh, this meeting is being recorded. <laughs> um, well, we we have about eighteen people, and uh, there may be more joining us. But I think uh, it's the moment. And if there's time at the end, we can have a, a general discussion because it's only our second meeting, and we could have a general discussion about. Uh, what people want um, in future meetings, but the next couple of meetings are lined up in terms of speakers. But on this occasion, highly anticipated, we have Lynn Ross, who is the CEO of PAL, and uh, we're very eager to hear more about this wonderful institution, which has, you know, historical connections with UBC people and. Uh, I think all in all has been a kind of a beacon in terms of social housing, and uh, we'd love to hear more. We did send Lynn some questions, but she may or may not um, address these, but let's turn it over. I'll to, try. Try my yeah, best. Yeah, turn it over to Lynn, and um, yeah, go ahead, Lynn. <laughs> okay, thank you. Hi, everyone. So uh, up until July, I was actually the executive director of PAL Vancouver and PAL Studio Theater. They're two separate societies and uh, we went through an amalgamation. Um, and we're now still all just PAL Vancouver. The society, the theater society does not exist anymore, but the theater does. So yes. when I came in, I've been the executive director here for two years and we had two separate boards, different people, on each board for the theater and the housing um, complex. And it was just so much overlap and wasted resources and, you know, human resources, financial resources, you name it. So um, that that's kind of what I've been working on, um, you know, for, for, for a year or so. And we're still, uh, I mean, it, it is completed, but I'm still there a couple stragglers. Um, uh, in terms of our board members just signing some final documents. So hopefully that'll happen before the end of the year. Um, yeah, digital signatures, really, um, I'm really pushing that for our board. <laughs> it, it, I mean, it, it sounds easy, but uh, for some reason they're, they insist on scanning. Um, so yeah, so now we're just uh, Pal Vancouver. Are, um, we have 111 units of residential housing here. Plus, on our eighth floor is a black box. For those who you who haven't been here, um, it is black box theater. So it really is uh, multi-purpose. Has lots of um, you know different uh, configurations. Western Gold is our um, kind of, you know, house theater production company. They do all of their productions in here. Right now, there is a play called 17 going on in our theater. I saw it yesterday. It's wonderful. So we've, they've been busy, you know, pretty much all year and they're going to be busy next year too. And we have other renters too. So right now we don't put any of our resources into um, the theater, it is just rental. So we don't put on our own production or anything like that. It's just, I, I mean, we're, we have so few, you know, staff people here that it takes all of us, um, you know, kind of working all the time to, to make PAL um, as standing for performing arts lodges. We just call it PAL, uh, that's, that's too much to say. Um, and yeah, so uh, I can give you a little, um, uh, I did send out the About PAL um, document. So basically our mission is to provide longstanding members of Metro Vancouver's performing arts professions with affordable housing in a vibrant and creative community setting. So that, um, that has been our mission all along. Um, PAL was first opened uh, in 2006. Uh, and in the Coal Harbor area. Um, and someone had mentioned during our uh, disc the brief discussion before, um, I think we started recording that there's going to be a new PAL um, in 2023. We're really excited in New Westminster. So uh, I've been to the site a couple times. It looks like it's gonna be ready in the spring. Um, we're not ready. <laughs> So I hope uh, I hope they're going to be delayed somehow. We'll be ready if we have to, but it is, you know, 
we have such a long waiting list and onboarding people and you know all of the paperwork and we're working with BC Housing on this project and the city of New West. So there, there's there's a lot to do. And there's always a lot to do at PAL. You know, given the age of the building, um, you know, we have a capital plan in place now um, as of last year. So as as you know, as buildings age, they, you know, they need um, more maintenance and, you know, people's appliances start going and all of this stuff. So we have it, it just an ongoing, ongoing, and plus we don't receive any government funding. So, you know, I was talking to someone um, a couple of days ago from the RBC Foundation. They're like, oh, you must receive, you know, government funding for this. Zero. <laughs> really. So it's really rental income and donations because we are a registered charity. So, um, yeah, so basically um, people who live at Pell, they're pretty much all from um, the performing arts. And certainly if they're in the RGI units, which is rent geared to income, um, which are the subsidized units, they have to be, they have to apply. Um, I approve the applications. Uh, my background is um, in arts administration. I worked at uh, SOCAN, the Society of Composers, Authors, and Music Publishers of Canada. I was a general manager for almost 20 years uh, for Western Canada. So, um, and I worked at the city and the arts department um, after that. So, I, you know, I do have that kind of background that, you know, I'm able to look at an application and, and really um, kind of see if that person has worked for most of their career. That's kind of, I mean, every application is a little bit different, but that, you know, that's what we say to people that you have had to have worked most of your um, career in the performing arts. So we have lots of, you know, actors and musicians and dancers um, who live at PAL. So um, yeah, it's, uh, it's really just, it's just a wonderful, wonderful place, you know, and these people um, being performing artists, they most of them, they do rely on government assistance uh, as their form of, of income uh, because they don't, you know, have a pension or they didn't earn enough during their career to contribute to their RSPs. So um, these, these artists are really in need of housing. So we try and also look at, you know, who has the greatest need. Our waiting list um, right now, um, we did pare it down. Um, when I started, it was over a hundred, hundred about 120 people. Um, but then I had my team go back and revisit everybody on that list to make sure they were honestly still alive <laughs> or still interested. Um, so we have about 80 people right now on our waiting list. And um, the red gear to income units, um, quite honestly, they just don't come up unless someone passes away, which is quite sad, but it's, the truth. So um, another reason why an RGI unit may come up is that someone, um, this is, a, this is not assisted living here. You have to um, have uh, your doctor sign off on a, um, a form saying that you're capable of independent living because we don't have resources here at all um, to, to support people. So we have had, a, in the couple of years that I've been here, we have had uh, I, I would say two or three people um, leave our um, leave our building to go into uh, assisted living. So that's a, another um, reason why someone why one of these units would come up. So in all of um, this year, we've had one unit come up, and that was the case that um, this this person was no longer capable of uh, taking care of himself. Um, so this is how the split goes. When Pell first opened in 2006, the split between the red gear to income, which is the subsidized, and what we call the near market units, which are about, it's about 10% below market value for this area. Right now, those near market um, units are going at um, 1690 is the rent there, which is, I mean, it's Vancouver, right? So um, that that's what we call our near market. And when PAL first opened in 2006, it was an 80-20 split. So 80% of our units were rent geared to income and 20% um, were near market. Now, about five or six years ago, um, I wasn't here, but, you know, 
documents. So I've gone through all of the documents. Um, they couldn't really afford to maintain the building and have that split. They they just couldn't make it work financially. Um, then again, I wasn't here. So um, they went back to BC Housing because we have an operating agreement with BC Housing because they put up startup money into this. Now we have a 60-40 split. So 60% of our units are rent geared to income and 40% are near market. Um, I, I would love to bring it back to 80-20. We'll see, you know, how the next, you know, couple, well, maybe even the next year it goes because we're, I mean, we, we really streamline a lot of things and applied for every grant um, and, and received really um, good support from a lot of BC housing programs, replacing our boilers and things like that. It costs like 50, 60, $70,000. So replaced our, all of our lighting to LED lighting, uh, we received a grant from that, BC Hydro. So there are a lot of things out there. You just really have to know how to find them and have someone uh, quite honestly apply for it. So we, we've done a lot of that in the, the last um, two years. Uh, our third, <laughs> um, oh, I guess, yeah, our residency type here on your question is life lease. Uh, we have 12 units that are life leases um and they're the only two bedroom every all the other um 99 units are one bedrooms and most people here we have a, have about 135 residents so most people do live alone here so the life leases um let me just pull up a document that I did not send um the life leases were necessary in the beginning um to fund this building. So the life leases in 2006 raised $3.14 million. Um, so they needed that, that money to, to make this place happen. And what happens is that, um, you know, back in 2006, all 12 units, um, people lease them. Um, they, you have to have the cash up front. You can't have a mortgage on these life leases. And they were around $250,000 at the time. So you basically are putting your money in and you're staying until really, you know, you're pass, you pass away uh, or you can leave. No one's ever just left. Um, and then your estate receives that money back. So, you know, and then we're able to lease it out to someone else later at a, at a higher amount. So I think the light, the last life lease was before my, it was about three years ago. So it was before I started and that went for about 400 and I think $25,000. Now it, it's just tricky with the life leases. We have a long waiting list for them as well. Um, they don't come up very often and they aren't part of the residential tenancy act. So there are a lot of weird things going on with the life leases and insurance and who is responsible for insurance, if it's PAL or if it's the life lease holder. Anyway, I'm not going to go down that road. Um, <laughs> I don't want to pull my hair out, but um, the, I was going to answer the third question. What would you not repeat if I, and I'm not doing life leases in New West at all. It is just, I understand why they had to do it to raise the money, but it's just, in my opinion, it's just a horrible model. And um, I'm pretty sure our insurance broker wants to kill me. So I won't do that to him. So we're not doing any more life leases. Um, ideally, I would like BC Housing to come in. I don't think it will happen, but I would like BC Housing to come in and purchase our life leases as they come up. And so we could have them as rental units. But anyway, that's just the wish list item. Um, so New West um, have the same options. So no. <laughs> it will just be um, 50, 50 split. There are 66 units. So 50, 50 split um, RGI rent geared to income, which is subsidized and your market. So we're still have, we're still waiting for our operating agreement from DC housing, but we know that that will be the case. We just don't know what the rents will be yet. So DC housing will set that for us. Um, your next question, uh, what was determined by stakeholders, financiers, or governments? Um, 
I'm not really sure. Could someone expand upon that question? I'm not really sure what you're asking here. I think it's about decision making, you know, where, where and consultation. Um, to what extent uh, there's a network of uh, consultation, decision making, who is included in that, um, are the residents included in that? I think that was no. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, we, I mean, once the building's up and running, um, like it is at Cardero, I mean, there's some things that we may go to the residents with, but generally no um there as you can imagine there are a lot of opinions <laughs> mm. and um like if it's something that you know directly affects them you know we've sent out surveys and things like that um which is helpful to you know kind of know what kind of things you know they would like to see in the building but as generally 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 not um, we are uh, for New West, um, similar stakeholders, um, you know, the province, the city, you know, the developer type of thing. But um, yeah, for especially for, for New West, we don't even know who's going to be living in the building yet. So, you know, we we can't really we, we've we've done some consultation with um, the arts community in New West. And we have a pe couple people on our New West Committee um, who are from the Performing Arts Committee community in New West. But yeah, since we don't know who the residents are going to be, it's it, you know it's really kind kind of impossible for for us to consult with them. But yeah, here it's just really um, on a case by case basis. But it's it's just much easier. Um, we do have, I think that's your your next question. Yeah, how is governance handled? We do have, um, we used to have two boards. Now we just have one board, which is great. And um, yeah, our I report to the board. The board makes, um, I present them with, and I just finished it today. That's why I was so busy this week. Um, our budget for 2023. So I will present that basically to our finance committee, our my finance committee will either say yay or nay and then make a recommendation to the full board um, at our next meeting. And if that passes, then we will, that will be our operating budget for 2023. So um, yeah, any kind of big decision making all comes from the board. Um, you know, the decision to have another building in New West, that was all decided by the board. So I, yeah, I'm. I, I'm here to serve them, basically. So, um, yeah. So we have a, a quite a diverse board. Um, lots of different. We have actors and um, someone, a film producer and a real estate um, agent. So we, you know, we have a, a lot. It's it's good to have you know people from from different uh, areas. Um, and is there a board with resident input? Well, there used to be. Uh, there used to be here uh, a residence committee. And as you can imagine, um, it uh, really not a lot got done. It was just um, really a complaint department, from what I understand. But right now on our board, our bylaws allow for three residents to be um, on our board. And right now we have two residents. So we do definitely hear from them uh, a lot at board meetings. Um, and uh, yeah, they're they're very involved, both of them are. So uh, I feel like the residents are really well represented. Also in the office where I am, you can't really see a blurry background, but where I am in the office um, next door, the um, our housing manager, um, like our door is open all day long. So people, you know, residents come and, you know, usually complain, but that's okay. That's why we're here. Um, yeah, we have residents coming and going out of this office all day long. So it's not like we don't know what the issues are, um, you know, at, at board meetings. We already 
you know, we already talked to all the residents and most of the residents are pretty good about like letting us know, um, very good about letting us know if they have any, um, you know, grievances. So yeah, I, I'm really not in favor of uh, kind of, you know, revisiting that, that residence committee. I, I think it's better to have a couple residents sit on the board where decisions are made. Otherwise they just kind of, you know, spin out and no, if no, if there isn't anyone with decision-making power, you know, on that resident committee, it just, it's kind of useless. Um, oh, sorry. There's some, I guess there are some questions in the chat. Yeah, so the, the, I'm really, sorry. I'm bad at this. Sorry. There's um, great questions. There's a question from Nicola about okay, how, how will you decide in the new West building who gets subsidized units and who has to pay market rent income test? Um, well, we basically for our um, rent geared to income or subsidized units, we're going to go from our wait list because there have been people on our wait list since, you know, 2006. So that's how we're going about it. You know, those people are already have already applied. Um, they've already been approved. So we'll start knocking those off. So that's how we'll do that. And it's not a matter of really who is getting subsidized and who's paying mar market rent. The people who are on our subsidized list really probably can't afford market rent. So they're kind of two different groups, if that makes sense. Also, I should mention the subsidized units, you have to be 55 or older to um, apply, to be on our subsidized, whereas our market rent or near market rent you could be any age. So we do have a number of people, like a lot of people who are who are under the age of 55 in here, but they're all um, on the normal, um, near market side, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the next question about how you finance. Finance New West without capital from life leases. Oh, we, we, we receive more money from BC Housing. So yeah, it was just, yeah, <laughs> that, that, and that's how, like, the, we received more money from BC Housing. We also had the developer, because um, things have changed so much since 2006. So with the developer, um, we have our tower, our little tower of 66, it's not even a tower, but our little building, and then there are towers of residential. So um, really the developer in their bid for this included social housing and we were the recipients of this of this building so that's uh are there two bedrooms in the u.s and what is square footage of the single bedroom? we don't have that information yet i believe there are i i don't think that there are two bedrooms i believe there are studios and one bedrooms um but we don't have any of the because we don't have our operating agreement we don't have any of that information of the um, square footage, but I I have been in one and I'll tell you, it's really small. Um, the units here, the one bedrooms here are much larger, but that's just the way building construction has gone in the last, you know, 15 years or so that, you know, you don't get those big bedrooms or big closets anymore. It's just really, it's, I mean, they're nice, but they're small, like you can't have, stuff in there <laughs> other than your your furniture so and it's really too bad because most of our artists you know performing artists are also fine artists so we have a lobby um on our first floor and we have a uh, wall space that our residents um have art shows every month a different resident will put up um their art and, it, and usually for sale, it's quite lovely. So, and, you know, they need space in their units to, you know, paint or do their mosaics or whatever medium they, you know, they. Well, that's a, that's a question actually, Lynn. Um, are there common spaces such as um, an art space mm -hmm. or anything? They're in the basement, well, parking level one, there is a, a, quite a big workshop where they they use the workshop to build the sets for the theater so that's used quite a bit 
Um, we don't have, um, you know, a sh I wish we did. We don't have a shared space for most people just, um, you know, stay in their units and, you know, create their art. We have our another amenity space on the floor that I'm on, the third floor is a library, which is really nice. It has um, also like a television because not everyone has TV here and two desks with computers um, that residents use because not everyone can afford internet or they, you know, they don't want that. Uh, and there's a outside space as well here on the third floor. And then of course the shared space upstairs, which is the theater, the lounge and our fabulous garden. So okay. yeah, it's used, it's used quite a, quite a lot in the, you know, in the summer. So those are really, really nice spaces. And every Monday, the residents have soup social and it's usually in the theater or if it's nice outside, they do it outside and they just get together and, and they've been doing this since the building opened. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they do, like, they'll do like a holiday dinner. They'll do an Easter dinner. Um, I also, when I, when I got here, I, you know, was made aware very uh, early on that there were people, um, this height of COVID and everything, uh, people living with food insecurity. So I applied for, um, for PAL to be part of the community agency partners at the Greater Vancouver Food Bank. We were really happy to get approved very quickly. So we've had our pantry program up and running for about a year and a half now. So we do that every, at least every month. And residents know if they're low on food that we probably have something in our pantry. And it, it's really, you know, it's really, it's changed people's lives. So we're really proud of that program. Uh, the single bedrooms are small at Coal Harbor. So New West are smaller. Yes, they're much smaller. Mm. Yeah, mm. they're tiny. So mm. I don't know. I don't know where people are going to put their clothes. I certainly couldn't <laughs> put my clothes in there but um if there is little common space what special consideration given to the soundproofing of the living unit in coal harbor or new west uh I'm this question think, was for I'm Sandra? thinking yeah i'm thinking either because um I don't know the mix of your residents, but I'm assuming that some sing or play instruments or um, do, do vocal exercises. So um, sometimes uh, buildings aren't suited for that. Yeah, as far as I know, it wasn't uh, purpose built, uh, meaning that it wasn't um, there was no extra build in for any kind of soundproofing. But to be honest, like I can hear you know, pianos down the hall. And I, th I think people knowing that they're going to live here, um, that's, you know, that's, that's part of the charm. So, I mean, I love it. Um, I've never had, I've had people complain about a lot of weird stuff here. I've never had anyone complain about noise or like music or anything like that. I think it's understood when you move in here that that will be the case. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, yeah, so that that's um that's kind of where we're we're at right now. It's uh yeah, it, it's just it's just really it's just a wonderful, wonderful place. And everyone who lives here is, you know, especially the subsidized um units. I mean, they're just they're just so grateful because I mean they would you know they say to me all the time that they would don't know what they would do. Like they would be like, I would literally be out on the street. Um our lowest um, uh, RGI rent gear to income um, is four hundred and seventy-five dollars. That's the rent, and that that's that's Amazing. Yeah. a lot of them. Mm. You know. Okay. Can I ask? Can I ask about the um, developer and where the building fits in with the developer? What What is What's the budget for the new building in New Westminster to build it? Or is it completely being bonused and the developer is handling the whole thing? You don't have to raise any money for it. Um, yeah, we don't have to raise any money for it. 
So it's bonus. This you you talked about your little. Yeah, it's between between hours. Be, yeah, between BC Housing and the developer. Yeah. A nice person to be in. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. There are a couple of other questions. Um, I think you've sort of answered the, the one. Do you have community events in your common space, like a Christmas party? I think yeah. that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and then there's another one about. Oh, will it be a garden, Black West Theater, New West? No, unfortunately not. And this is something that I've talked to um, with uh, the president of the board uh, quite a bit. He fully agrees that any more properties that Pal acquires, like that has to be part of it. Like this building without the theater is just a building. Like the, the theater is the heart of the, of this space, you know, and quite honestly, I would not have taken this job if it were not for the theater. You know, the, the theater is, is everything here. Um, in New West, there is a small, I haven't seen it, uh, only seen drawings. There's a smaller amenity space on the top floor. It won't be large enough for theater, but I'm hoping that it will at least be large enough for some kind of communal activity. So, I, but as for a theater, no, sadly, sadly, mm -hmm. no. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I just like the idea of having PAL without a theater is just, I mean, it is what it is. We'll take, well, you know, we'll take it. It's, you know, it's housing for artists, but I mean, it, uh, yeah, just, it, it's going to be, it's going to be strange for yeah. sure. Okay. I, um, so I don't know if I'm still muted or if I can. Uh, yeah, no, yeah. we can hear you. Okay. Um, are you connected with uh, Toronto anymore? Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, connected in that we're all um, under the umbrella of PAL Canada. We have quarterly meetings okay. um, and all of the chapters across Canada meet and, you know, kind of share best practices and notes and, mm -hmm. you know, all kinds of things. I've actually been helping um, PAL Ottawa quite a bit because uh, they're, they're doing their build now. So yeah, I've been able to to share a lot of information with them, which is which is great because that's you know well it's great that, that artists can stay in their communities. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Any other questions for Lynn? Okay. That's been wonderful and incredibly informative. So, and uh, I, I think for me at least, I, I, I hear your pain in the sense that one of the things that has been so important and central to the lives of artists is the theatre. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, mm, something. Well, they cool. have a. They have. Um, if I remember correctly, they do have a, a baby grand on that on the eighth <laughs> floor as well, don't they? Yeah, we have yeah yeah we have a grand piano in the theater. We also have an upright piano in the uh, eighth floor lobby area. Okay, I thought it was the other way around, but okay. <laughs> okay. Maybe it used to be. Yeah, well, and they also the the arts work exhibit exhibitions are nice in the lobby and on the eighth floor too. So it's yeah. Yeah, the, the, there's a permanent kind of collection on the eighth floor, and then the lobby um right. switches out every month so yeah it's great and then the residents are also encouraged to put up their own art on their on the floors where they they you know each have wall right. space um mm -hmm. out in the hall so yeah it's just really like every floor is so different mm -hmm. in terms of in terms of the art that's on the wall it's uh it, it's quite lovely yeah. So, I mean, it's just, yeah, it, it's really just a really, really special place. Um, and yeah, it, it's a lot of work. Though. Cool. Yeah. yeah, that's that's very clear. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But the, the key is having um, 
the key to, to r- the, running this whole show is honestly is um, the housing manager. I mean, I can do all the men, men in the world, um, but, you know, knowing, having a housing manager who, you know, that's her background, she knows everything about the Residential Tenancy Act, all of that is, you know, it's just so important, um, you know, keep to keep, you know, the, the building and the people housed and the moving in and the out and all of that. So, uh, you know, I certainly don't sit here and take all the credit. It's, uh, you know, it really is a team effort. Um, you know, we have a wonderful um, new development manager who's also our communi- communications manager. So we've d- we done our website, all of our social media, all of that stuff. And um, we're really um, have some wonderful, um, you know, new donors as well. So that's really important. It just, it just takes so much. And um, we, we've had a really, we've been fortunate. We've been through COVID and everything we've, we've, we've been okay. And everyone's like healthy too. So we were really, really fortunate during COVID that we didn't have any cases. Wow. Mm. Yeah. Very good. Well, um, if there aren't any more questions, perhaps we'll let you go, Lynn, because I know that you're super busy and maybe the rest it's, of us can talk a bit more generally. about. It, yeah, it's been a week, but uh, yeah. no, I, I'm, I'm happy to answer questions and um, maybe through you if someone um, yeah. has any other questions that uh, are burning uh, after I go, uh, I'd be happy to answer any Absolutely. questions. Thank you so much. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thanks okay. very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay um so for the rest of us so let's have a bit of a chat about um what our expectations are and uh where we would like this to go our next speaker um for december is actually um catherine uh, kingfisher whose book about the key side uh community is very, very uh, illuminating. And it's co-housing, it's not co-op. Um, so she has just produced a book called Collaborative Happiness. <laughs> and she was is very much uh, was involved in the setting up of Keyside, which is in North Vancouver, which is a co-housing um, development. And uh, n- very knowledgeable. Um, if you can get hold of her book, beforehand that'd be you know great but uh we'll certainly uh have a lot of questions for her but is there what i'm curious about uh is and i hope people will email me is where you think you would like to what things you would like to see where you want this to go those sorts of questions does anyone have any comments Oops. Well, I. Oh, sorry. Someone else is going to speak here. No, Come okay. on. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I just um, I was basically solely interested in in Pal because that's right. my orientation. I've been in the business for over fifty years, so it's um, uh, mm-hmm. and I have seen. I have had friends that have stayed at the Pal, and I also have had friends that stayed in Toronto. Um, so I was interested to hear how it's evolved, um, right. but I'm not in a position to do any sort of co-housing or things mm-hmm. like that. So I think I'm going to leave you, but I really appreciate, I really appreciate you signing me in and letting me join in this discussion today. So thank you very much. Okay. Thank you and uh, good luck. <laughs> thank you very much. Okay. Okay, others who are left, any questions or comments or, um, uh, yes, yes, Joyce. I think I understand now why that my pal is not considered co-housing, <clears throat> because mm-hmm. the little bit of work research that I've done on co-housing is it everybody owns their place. It's like a strata, and mm-hmm. then it's communal areas. So mm-hmm. each one is structured differently, but this one is basically run, run as a rental um, building. 
-hmm. and the structure is very different. And that's why it wasn't called co-housing from the beginning. That's all I was saying. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> And I think a lot was revealed in terms of the decision-making processes that um, there isn't the kind of, uh, yeah, input from in the, the residents. Yeah, of the residents. Um, Nicola. Well, I was going to say sort of the same thing, that, that, that this power is obviously a model on its own and has all kinds of issues that we wouldn't have with co-housing um, there seemed to be a lot of administration. Now I belong to a co-op at the moment um, and we have a board and, and they do a budget and they, and they work quite hard, I think, but there's nothing like the kind of work involved that she was describing. Um, and I think that's because it was PAL and there's all that, that you know, a separate organization involved as well um, with different needs. So I don't think we would, run into those sort of problems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, other comments, questions? I'm interested to hear from, from people where, where they would like this group, um, ideally, where they would like this to go. <laughs> I'll just well, say I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm, I I'm, I'm learning. Things. I'm learning and, and trying to figure things out. I think that it sounds like the the co housing. I'm in a fortunate position financially that that would work out. I don't need to worry about um, the uh, income based uh, rental and things. So. Um, Mm. but I'm, I'm just exploring. I think, and, and many have, uh, my friends and so on have talked about this, that, um, you know, there are a lot of um, uh, impulses around at the moment that uh, things have to change. And the idea of community, building community and building community is important at all stages of one's life, but building community in terms of uh, aging um, demographic, uh, I think, is very much in the air, and it's something that a lot of people are curious about, and also uh, what the possibilities are, even in a challenging, financially challenging context like uh, Vancouver. Um, some of us have actually been talking about the possibilities of uh, whether it's even feasible in any sh shape or form of creating something at UBC. Um, that That is one possibility. That's one goal. But the, I really would like to hear more about what people might be interested uh, in, in doing further. Yes. I, I, think, I think part of it is you have to have some idea of the scale of the operation because are we talking about building a building like they were doing? That's a huge project. Yes. Or are we talking about taking over a building or three buildings or two houses or something like that and creating some sort of collective co-housing situation. Those are very different models. And that's basically what you're asking, what people would prefer. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But also what's possible at UBC. Alison, you had your you had your hand up. Right. Yes, I have an idea. Um, so in, in terms of what do I see as why am I interested? Which mm -hmm. is the question that you're asking. Why, why are we even interested? Mm -hmm. uh, I just like the idea of being part of a community that pools resources so that not only do you have one's own uh, living space, but there's opportunities to gather um, with other people from the group, but also maybe perhaps like with an extended family or a book club, you know, shared space that is being used um, uh, for social purposes. And, um, you know, with possibilities of, uh, you know, when they mentioned the idea of a, so, a soup social, I think it was, 
you know, the, the possibility of uh, some shared meal preparation on certain occasions or periodically or oh, mm. that kind of thing. Um, I'm a bit divided in my own head about whether I like the idea of it being, you know, say, for example, mostly retired people, older people, or a mixed generation. So I really welcome some discussion about that. I do feel that we're, you know, kind of in silos in terms of age. I live in a strata where, I mean, there are some younger people, but, you know, three quarters of the people are over 70. Yeah. So it can be a real struggle to... So yeah. one of one of the ideas about you know having you know let's dream uh, purpose built um, yes building at UBC is that you are right next door cheek by jowl with um, different generations of students and faculty so they're sort of right there and the other thing that's certainly um, of importance to me and others um, is that we don't stop being you know, teachers and researchers and scholars just because we've reached a certain age. You know, there are ways that we can continue the teaching, certainly continue the research, share the research with each other, with others in that, um, you know, community that are juxtaposed with ours. So there are ways that the college, the Emeritus College is already doing that um, and very successfully. And there could be more of that to build on that sharing that knowledge which we you know we've acquired with hard work uh and and it gives us continues to give us pleasure and that we can actually share this with the other members of the very extended community so that's that's built into it it's uh all kinds of uh facets to it uh it's it's not just one thing it's not just about um you know being together living nearby but, but that we are immersed in a very diverse community in all kinds of ways also well, interdisciplinary but i'm thinking more in terms of the the resident mix like whether that would um be you know geared towards emeritus folks or whether it would have a more well, we we do have we do have um, you know faculty housing right there. I mean, there are intergenerational housing at UBC. It just yeah. is. Um, so that is surrounds us. So okay. it wouldn't be it wouldn't be quite the same as as uh, perhaps a, a building or something that's outside that UBC kind of community, um, which would be a different and that would be very pertinent. But I think in, in the UBC, if we think of the UBC context, it is very much intergenerational and it has um, different cohorts of uh, people at various stages um, of living, including families, um, young families. So it's it's right there. That's partly what I'm saying. It's right there. And the degree to which if there's um, common spaces that one can, you know, um, have teaching opportunities, uh, learning from each other opportunities, whatever. I mean, that's that's all part of it, I think. Other comments? Or? Interacting with the surrounding community, people in other buildings takes really strong intention, um, even oh, with yeah. space. Like I, if I think of interacting with children, they're either in the building and you see them running around or you have intentional space, like, like play space on the property mm -hmm. for interacting. It doesn't just, it just doesn't, doesn't happen without that kind of forethought. And to me, uh, I I love I love being older. I love older people, but I want to be around young people too, including mm -hmm. children. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Well, that's the beginnings <laughs> of a conversation, and we'll hear more from because uh, Keyside is very much a, an intergenerational co-housing. Um, and and they've got very. I've visited them. And they've got you know at all ages, including babies, babies. <laughs> so uh, we'll hear more from Catherine, and and uh, this gives us an opportunity to prepare our questions and to prepare yeah what it is uh, that we ideally would like to see. 
So thank you. San- Sandra's got her hand up. Sandra, where are you? Sandra oh. Wilkins. Yeah. That little hand is. I you know, it's lost in the light. It was lost in the light. Uh, Go on, Sandra. Oh. Oh, okay. Um, I just, um, I'm really learning. Um, so I'm interested in um, the speakers that we have had. And um, I was quite interested in reading about the Driftwood Village. And um, it may be too late in my life, but ideally, I would be interested in working on a community where um there was more thought put into um, the types of places that I think more of us want to live in uh, with more uh, sustainability and um, different building techniques to take advantage of the heat and the cooling and um, just a more thoughtful environment than what we're able to um, purchase or rent on our own. Uh, I'm a renter right now. Yeah, so I'm just absolutely, absolutely. You know, ideally, since we're allowed to dream, if we have have a progressive um, architect um, to to investigate those sorts of possibilities, one of the um, ventures like that that I'm familiar with in Australia is called Nightingale Housing, and they work with a at the core of it is a very progressive architectural complex and they put up sustainable housing. Um, I'm familiar with Melbourne in different parts of Melbourne. Um, but that's the sort of ideally that's exactly what one wants absolutely yes so I think what I'd like to um, learn more about explore is um, uh, how would uh, if other people are interested how do we uh, form a group such as uh, the one that started at Driftwood Village whether it's at UBC or somewhere else Mm. What what is actually involved? What are the timelines? And is it feasible for um, a group like ours to embark on something like that? So Good. that's just my initial thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. We'll note that. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so we've sort of come to the end. And uh, as I said, the next meeting will be Catherine. Um, and we'll hear more about a different model. But thank you for coming, and uh, yes, more soon. Thank Thanks you so very much, much for organizing, organizing it, Snedja. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, See you next month. Bye-bye.